Good evening, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started with our panel discussion tonight. Thank you all for being here, and welcome to this evening's um, panel talk with a really great group of women that I'm going to be so delighted to tell you about in a few minutes. Um, this panel discussion honors the last week of an exhibition that we have just outside the doors called Our Own Work, Our Own Way, and it's Ascendant Women Artists from the Johnson Collection, which is on view until Sunday, uh, May 21st, so this is the last week to check it out. Um, if you don't know the Johnson Collection, they're right up in Spartanburg, so I would encourage everybody to go and make a visit. Um, they they welcome the public, and it's a phenomenal resource to have in our community. Uh, my name is Jackie Adams. I am the Director of Art and Learning here at the CMA, and it is my pleasure to moderate tonight's discussion, I'm telling you, with a rock star uh, panel of people who serve to champion advancement and contributions of women in and around the world. And I will say that especially in an era of renewed and new social movements, our society continues to explore meaning and practices of creativity, justice, and women and advancement of equal rights. And just like generations before, today we see conversations around women and their creative work and their rights at the fore. So in this exhibition, Our Own Work, Our Own Way, these themes are examined through a, his a historical lens, but we're going to bring it forward tonight in a contemporary conversation because some of the themes that we're gonna talk about are more relevant than ever. So thank you all for being here tonight. I wanna frame up the discussion tonight and just let you know how it's gonna flow and how it's gonna go. We're gonna center the conversation around four themes with our panel. And I wanted to break it down because these themes connect to what you see in the exhibition. The four themes that we're gonna talk through tonight, pathways, activism, generations, and the future. I've already spoken with our panelists to kind of get them warmed up to some of these ideas, and I've learned a tremendous amount, and I think you will too tonight. We're gonna consider the historical, current, and future efforts and ideas that have affected the struggle for equal rights and advancement of women around the world by bringing together some conversation through this really great, diverse, and rock star group of panelists. So it's a lot to cover, um, and so let's get started. Uh, I'm going to do introductions, but I'm not going to do the typical introductions. I'm going to do very quick ones. We have a handout that we printed online because we did more extensive bios, and um, we're going to have those available for you after the talk. So I'm going to give you just a very quick title for each person, because our first theme is going to delve into a more holistic uh, conversation about what biography really means. So I'm joined tonight in conversation with this dynamic group of people doing the work. Jan, Jan Dreskin Haig, sitting right next to me, she is an artist in the exhibition, Our Work Our Own Way. Jan, thank you so much for being here. Melissa Burnett, next to her, is a civil rights attorney with Burnett, Shoot, Shut, and McDaniel Law Firm. Um, and you'll hear more about the amazing work that she does. And then next to her, Jennifer Bartell Boykin, an educator and Columbia's new poet laureate. Very honored to have you here. And then we have Kenya Cummings, who was a community organizer for REN, the Women's Rights Empowerment Network, a rockin' group in South Carolina. And then last but not least, we have Nakisa BG. Did I say that correctly? Beggy, thank you. She is a proud Iranian-American artist and recently was a participant in the Art Fields competition. And we are so thrilled to have you as part of our community, Nikisa. Thank you all for taking time tonight to be here. So with that, um, I gave you just a quick bio. We're gonna go ahead and start our first uh, theme and our, some of our questions to delve a little bit deeper through who you are through the life that you have lived and are living right now. Here's a picture of everybody on stage. <laughs> This is a, a great shot from one of the pieces that you'll see in the exhibition. And what I'd like to do is kind of frame up a thought for you. 
Our work, our own work, our own way. Think about that title for just a moment. This exhibition title illustrates how women have used their platforms and their personal experiences to create pathways that make an impact on the advancement of equal and women rights, women's rights around the world. So what I wanna ask this panel is when in your life, and I'm gonna start this question in alphabetical order, so we'll start with Nikisa, but when in your life did you start to recognize you were going your own way to define your own work? And how did those choices start to shape your why to create this life and how you were gonna make a difference for equal rights and for women's advancement in the world? And Nikisa, I have a slide of your work behind me and I would love to start with you because right now in Iran, there is a dire situation and you are fully in the center of that both as an Iranian American and as an artist. So, yeah. Hey, hello, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And um, yes, before I answer the question, I'd like to explain the situation of the uh, women in Iran. Uh, the, according to the global gender um, gaps, uh, um, the rank of the uh, Iran's uh, women's rights uh, is 140 uh, out of 144 countries. So uh, I just want to give you an image what's happening in Iran for the women. Uh, as a woman, we don't have a right, right uh, to ride a bicycle or motorcycle. We don't have right to go to a stadium. We don't have right to singing or dancing. We have a, um, a specific dress code, which is a job that we must wear uh, in the public area. And if you reject to wear or uh, wear a hijab or um, your hijab is not good enough, uh, we have a kind of morality police that can arrest you and send you to the prison. And uh, uh, it is a lot of stuff that as a woman we must do or we must not to do uh, in Iran. And personally, I uh, be harassed several times with the uh, morality police. Or for example, I, I remember uh, one day I be banned to go to my uh, classroom in my university only because the color of my pants was pink. Uh, it is not legal to wear a uh, light colors in the campus. And I have a lot of this kind of story in my uh, life, but um, if I want to answer the question, my own way always was to try, I've tried to break the walls. I've always tried to stand against the discrimination. I have uh, tried to uh, talk about it. And if I know, for example, hijab in Iran is a law, and uh, but I have I believe that if it's some if uh, a law is um, uh, not correct, we should not accept it. And I always in my artworks or in my um, other ways, I have tried to uh, stand against the women. And uh, yeah, that's thank you, thank you, Kenya. Yeah, I think forging my own way or figuring that out has been an interesting path. I grew up as um, the child of a preacher and a social worker. And so service and figuring out how you are in deep commitment to your community has always been central to me figuring it out. I entered deep rebellion around that um, <laughs> because I didn't want to show up and um, people talk about walking in your family's footsteps. Um, so I didn't want to do that, but ultimately am in a field where my primary work is helping people. Um, and I find like balance in that for me because I saw an, a way where people did that service to their detriment. Um, and I'm trying to figure out a way, not always doing it well, <laughs> of how do I be in service to my community, but also take good care of myself. So like that's like the path that I think, the pathway that I'm trying to forge, not always true to it, but working to lean lean into it. And so I'm really grateful to be on a panel today with artists and with people who have this commitment to um, expressing life in a way that other people can digest and take from 
like use as fuel for their own journey. Thank you. Jennifer. So I, I always like to start with when I started writing poetry. That's kind of when I came into my own. And I started writing poetry when I was 13 years old. I'm from a small town called Johnsonville. Uh, it's in the middle of nowhere, one stoplight in the whole town. We got a second one when I was in uh, high school. Um, so I'm familiar and just used to the country and the field and, and, and the woods. And so a lot of what I write about is giving voice to that Southern black experience. Um, experience in life as a young girl um, in the rural South. So a lot of what I write about is recovering memories, um, my own memories, cultural memories, historical memories of um, black people in the area and trying to give voice to those. Um, so that's one of my primary um, goals with my work is to give, give voice to um, the people who haven't had one or the people who have been doing work for years and years and haven't gotten any recognition for the work that they've done. So that's a big part of what I do as a poet. And I feel like my work as a teacher is also connected to that. My teaching is an extension of my poetry and that I'm helping young people find their own voices. I'm helping them figure out how to express themselves, their joys, their pains, their hurts, all that, um, all that that they have inside that they sometimes keep bottled up. Thank you. Well, I think I was 18 years old when I realized I was going to have to be a, a change agent and take some risks. Um, like you, I grew up in a small town in the middle of nowhere until I was 10 years old, Morven, North Carolina truly in the middle of nowhere. I think we had a stop sign somewhere. <laughs> but um, between, until I was 10 years old, um, and this was in the 50s, um, I saw crosses burning at night and I asked my parents what that was and it was very, very scary. And they would try to explain it, but I, you know, they didn't know how to explain that. Then we moved to Ohio and during the summers in the 1960s, I would come back to that little town and work as a waitress in a truck stop and stay with my grandparents. And um, one day, um, all over town during the night, the Klan had put up posters on the all the telephone poles advertising a fish fry they were gonna have. And it just incensed me. And somehow I figured out that it was illegal to post flyers on public utility poles. So I took it upon myself to walk around town and take down all the flyers and pretty soon I was being followed by a truck full of Klansmen. <laughs> and um, they came to where I was working and threatened me and the owner, and he ran them off. Then they threatened to burn down my grandparents' house and threatened my family. Um, and it really scared me, and I said to myself, well, there are consequences when you oppose people, but I'm still glad I did it. Um, and that's what launched me, and I said, me with my white privilege, I can only imagine how a black person might feel. So I've, I've tried to um, keep that going. I've always um, felt empowered to make my own art. I think since I was very young, eight years old, I grew up with a, my mother as an artist and she was super encouraging to me. So I was developing my own voice from the very beginning. Um, and so I think that women making art, they um, empower all the women in the world. Um, so I did develop my own style and I keep working toward that. And there are always all kinds of um, things that I work on with climate change and, and the environment that always creep into my art, but there are lots of different things. If somebody looks at it, they may or may not see. Thank you. I wanted to start with that question because, you know, you could easily read a bio about each of you, but we are more fully formed than listing our degrees and what jobs we hold. And for these individuals doing this work, um, that kind of impact goes much deeper and much farther. 
in their history outside of just what can be said in a bio. So thank you for sharing that. Um, one thing we're gonna do is I wanna hear, uh, as we have a discussion, some of those threads and commonalities that you share within each of your diverse experiences and pathways. Um, I think one thing I heard is courage, you know? That's a big word that comes to the surface for me when I hear this. Yeah. Um, and feel free to respond. Feel free to jump in, add any thoughts. Um, what I want to do is go into the second theme, because the three other themes kind of give us a little bit deeper picture of, of the work that you've done. And the next one is around activism. So this theme of activism that come up in the show, and I wanted to show a picture of one of the artists in the show, Louise Maylou Jones, who was born in 1905 in Boston, Massachusetts. And I wanted to read a quote, because I think the quotes are important, hearing the artist's voice in terms of how we're going to talk about this theme. And this is a quote that we put in the show. It wasn't easy. There was a double handicap, being a woman, being a woman of color. I kept going on with determination. As I look back, I wonder how I've done it. So I think that's a very poignant sort of quote to think about from the artists themselves. You know, generally speaking, activism is some type of vigorous action to support and oppose a controversial issue. That's kind of like the textbook definition. But we see in many forms, most recognizably through like protests, um, marches throughout history, what activism sort of traditionally looks like. But Bill Moyer wrote about different roles of activists in social movements and how they need to play together successfully to create social change. He wrote about the citizen, the rebel, the change agent, and the reformer. And each of those roles in their own way has purpose, style, and skills, and needs, and they can be played out effectively or ineffectively. So those are just kind of some thoughts. And, and now I want to kind of get into the question and discussion of that idea for each of you. So I guess my question would be, my question would be that would you consider yourself an activist and or would you identify with any of these roles, the citizen, the rebel, the change agent, the reformer? And if so, how has the idea of activism in its broad sense manifested for you personally and also through the work that you do? And I would love to start, if I could toss it out, to Melissa. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, I consider myself an activist. Um, and in my legal work, you know, sometimes we represent individuals and can help individuals. But I naturally tend to accept cases that will affect a lot of people, not just an individual. And when, when we accept cases that will make change for a lot of people, I think that's how I be, I'm an activist. For example, um, opening up the Citadel to women. I was involved in that case. Um, knocking down the six-week abortion ban that we did this year. Um, representing Colleen Condon and um, Nichols Blackley in the same-sex marriage case. Um, opening up um, contact sports to girls in, in uh, public schools. Um, working on Equal Rights Amendment, which still hasn't passed. Um, so I really like to accept cases that can change things for, for a lot of people, and I guess that makes me an activist. <laughs> uh, even though I, I'm a certified specialist in employment and labor law, I do that to you know, support my family and support my law firm so I can take these other cases that change things for a lot of people. And that's what I like to do. So it changes me, too, I think, because I, I hope I can help a lot of people with those cases. And we talked, you and I talked a little bit on Zoom about how your story that goes back to being 18, you knew then and there, you saw how these actions could affect your loved ones and you felt um, a sense of purpose to protect them. Do you want to elaborate on that idea a little bit? Yeah, I think that really launched me into wanting to do things that would change um, things for a lot of people. And it's very frightening now to see things going backwards, but we won't get into that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll open up to anyone who want, might want to jump in on that idea of activism. 
one one thing we um talked about earlier was you know what does being an activist mean and what does it look like and i feel like for me personally i don't i don't think i would put the label activist on myself but i believe that my work can make a difference so i'm not out there i'm not out protesting or you know doing things like that but i believe that the voice that i use in my work and the truth that i tell in my work is a form of activism yeah we talked about with protests you know i i don't do protests either and i'm doing the work very similar to you and i share that idea that I tend to have a little bit of protest guilt around it, you know, like I should yeah. be out there. And, and Kenya, you, you had a great thought with community organizing because I, you know, we, we talk about this theme activism, but it's a broader, more nuanced idea. And, and you brought forth some really interesting things from your role. Yeah. So, um, first to start the first part of the question around activism mm -hmm. and I, probably out of most of us up here, when people look at what I do on the day to day, folks would point and say, you're an activist. And I don't, I don't hold that title. Um, activism, people are often thinking about an action. Um, it's often flashy. Um, people have a distinct memory of it. And a lot of my work is actually boring. Um, grunt work, <laughs> um, connecting or having long conversations with individuals. And so when we were talking about activism and not having that moment of being in the street or being at the state house or being in those moments, I kind of recoiled and said, I don't need, I don't need y'all to do that work. I need for you to do the work that you do on a daily basis and to find your consistent um, method of action and showing up. And for some folks, that's like um, this incredible lawyer who can jump into cases and collaborate and give their expertise in that way. And for others, it's like calling and letting your friends know I don't know what quite is going on at this state house right now, but I think we need to pick up the phone and make a phone call. Um, that those things are actually impactful and can change um, the reality when we are like more united in force. And those are often the things that people think of, don't understand that people didn't just march on Washington or things. There was a lot of um, individuals in the background who will never be written down in history who were doing really important work that right. made that moment. So people that are having that guilt, if you can find your consistent moment, you shouldn't have guilt around not being there for a flashbang moment or a super historic moment because those individual footsteps together are really going to take us as a like community into mm -hmm. a forward place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I think um, there are a lot of artists who work in the background. They're not going to the protests, but they're working every day on their artwork. And a lot of times their artwork really brings out things in the world that mm -hmm. people need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. The whole show is sort of based on this idea that as women in this exhibition were working, their male counterparts were receiving huge recognition. And so we see an exhibition like this come forward because we need to have that. We need to understand that those women were working just as hard and just as much, mm -hmm. but not receiving the recognition at the time until much later. So it's important to say that. Yeah. For me, uh, I can't uh, count myself as an activism because I know a lot of Iranian, the strong and brave women in Iran who, uh, just know what is the consequence of that, for example, if they right. remove their hijab and go outside. But they accept that and uh, we have a lot of young women who are in prison only because they reject to wear hijab. Uh, like Yasaman Shajarizadeh and Sabo Korlafshari who, and much more than these who are now in a prison for around 10 years only because they reject to wear hijab. Mm -hmm. And um, b when I compare myself with them, I can't uh, count myself as an activism because they pay with their life uh, to, uh, to act. Uh, but I always like to amplify the women's voice and uh, I always like to uh, break the walls and talk about the, these kind of things uh, at least in my artworks so mm -hmm. yeah Nikis I think just taking a pause to think about what you just said that in the United States we have 
certain degrees of freedom where we can voice and not live in fear of someone coming behind us and removing us from that situation, just even at the smallest acts that we take for granted in this country. And I think it's important to pause for a moment and really feel the gravity of what that means, what you just said. You know, small acts can be um, dramatically, have dramatic consequences to them. So thank you. Um, we'll move into our next theme. And because um, we definitely want to save time for some questions um, at the end and some more discussion. So our next theme is around generations. And you see in this exhibition really wonderful layers of generations. And um, an artist that I want to show to illustrate this is Jeanette Dreskin. And Jeanette Dreskin was born in 1921. She is the mother of Jan Dreskin Haig sitting next to me. Jeanette is still living. She's 101 years old to be 102 this September. And she's from Greenville, South Carolina. This is her piece and it's in the show. And her quote, I love this quote, in my work, growth, love, and order mingle with death and destruction. The past and future surround me. So I love this idea in this exhibition that you're standing on the shoulders of who have come before us. And we use this phrase um, because it sort of credits understanding and discoveries from our predecessors that have come before us. And there's a really interesting story just behind Jeanette's um, 101 years being on this planet. Um, so when we think of this phrase, like standing on the shoulders of, what comes to mind for you in your history? Who do you credit in history, in your life, to stand on the shoulders of them? Who has lifted you to be who you are today? And I'd love to start that with the daughter of Jeanette Dreskin, Jan. Having um, an artist mother really shaped my life. Um, I definitely stand on her shoulders and carry on her concerns for the environment. Um, we had a mutual admiration society always. Um, so we always loved each other's art. Um, it was just natural to me that my mother worked as an artist and a teacher, and that inspired me to make art and to be creative. Um, we both look at the earth for inspiration, and we both see lots of life and death and all kinds of things going on on our planet. And um, I work with that, too. Um, Women artists who came before me have all inspired me. I thought it was really interesting to see Elaine de Kooning's um, artwork in the right. exhibition. Mm -hmm. She came to the Greenville Art Museum and gave a workshop that I got to attend. It was fabulous. Mm -hmm. All these people, all the women artists and, well, male artists too. Right. But as right. we really do stand on um, the people that have worked in the past and continue to work. If I can share a little bit about your mother's story, being 101, uh, Jeanette Dreskin remembered a time when she was a young artist when she had to sign her artwork in initials because she had teachers tell her that if they could recognize that she was a woman, she wouldn't be taken seriously. So she came up in an era where she had to really be very careful about those choices. And she ended up actually being the first MFA student at Clemson University. And she is historical in that way. And she has lived through decades and periods and movements where eventually she got to use her full name and she got to tell the world who she really was as a woman artist. I think that's really profound mm -hmm. for your mom. I think she always worked though thought of herself more as an artist than yeah. a woman artist. Absolutely. She wanted to be recognized as an artist without any right. definition with sex. That's how many of us kind of go into it, mm -hmm. right? Like we yes. don't go in thinking we have to hide ourselves in any shape or form. I remember that and until somebody externally tells you, oh, wait a minute, hold on, you uh, know? I was talking to her um, yesterday and she said that you can't tell who made the painting, whether it was made by a woman or a man. Right. Right. Very nice. Thank you. I'll open it up to any of the panelists that would like to 
I would like to go next because my my person is actually my grandmother and she lived to 102. So um, she was born in 1911 and um, she was born to a very poor family. She had to drop out of um, school in like the fifth grade, Um, but she was literate. She was one of the few people in the neighborhood who could read and write and people brought their letters to her for her to read and she wrote letters for people. Um, but by the time I was born in 1983, um, you know, she was, she was, uh, one of my cousins once said, she's been old my whole life, (laughs) (laughs) which is, is, you know, she was in her seventies when I was born. And so I spent a lot of time at her house and she would always tell stories and she would tell me the same story over and over and over again. And eventually I realized like grandma's telling me this story because she wants me to remember and writing was the way I chose to remember. Um, She's a huge part of me becoming a writer. A lot of my early poems are actually in her voice Um, and she was Geechee, so she had a very distinctive way of speaking. Um, So Irene Harvin McCray um, was her name and she, I definitely, I'm very sure that she knew I was going to be a writer before I did. Um, And she always encouraged me and pushed me. And I owe so much. I owe her this huge, huge debt. And she passed away in 2013. um, But I carry with I carry her with me to this day. Thank you. I credit teachers, teachers, (laughs) teachers. Um, Law school, though. There were no women, (laughs) Um, no women role models when I went. Um, until you get to the national level, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who I got to meet, and I was sworn in at the U.S. Supreme Court, and I have a picture of me standing beside her, and it was just wonderful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I like to go beyond myself, uh, and uh, as I, as you mentioned, uh, recently a kind of revolution happening in Iran uh, around. Uh, five months ago, after the death of the Masa Amini, a 22 years old uh, girl who be killed by the morality police, and after that, a kind of women revolution happened. Uh, the title of that women woman life freedom, and um, we are still in there. And it is interesting because uh, in the Iran social media, uh, women and people started to um, share the articles and. Uh, the story of the other strong women around the world that who uh, stand against the uh, um, discriminations and uh, the people like uh, Rosa Parks or other uh, strong um, women now is um, uh, very trend in the social media of Iran that we should stand against the discrimination too. We should, this is, okay, hijab is a law in our country, but uh, uh, slavery was a law also. So we should stand against them. If the law is not correct, we should stand. And it is interesting, I think, um, the, her- uh, the heritage that we have is the strong women who was lived before us in the in this world, and now we should learn from them and uh, we should inspire by them. So you're looking globally, Nikisa, at different people in the world who have championed these efforts. Yeah, love that. I think uh, the folks I stand on the shoulder are, are that I've connected to you are in like kind of different generations. So definitely feeling resonance around my grandmother and other elders um, and folks, I won't even begin to call a role of like black women organizers who have um, really helped me stay in my work, whether that's paid or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also think about like the connection to a generation um, that is yet rising um, and their like willingness to, to show up and to show out and to um, really play with like the concepts of gender um, mm-hmm. um, and, and and define that on their own terms, whether that, that they be gender expansive people or just not allowing larger society to frame what it means to be mm-hmm. a woman or a girl or black or an activist or an organizer really thinking through that. And so how, conversations, particularly a lot that I've been having with high schoolers have been really framing my brain around if they think that it's 
tangible for us to have change, then there is possibility um, there. And if they think it can be done in another way, I think so much of like organizing or activism or even art is about what other people have done <laughs> and right. not necessarily about what um, is speaking or calling to you or how you want to show up in the world. So I think I think about these two different being in the middle of two gener- generations, like my family mm-hmm. and my family, like I'm the first generation after se- segregation. And then I have cousins who like were born um, with Barack Obama being their president. So they just have a very different view right, of what right. possibility models are. And I don't mean like just representation, but I mean, just mm-hmm. they don't get it. Like I recently have tried to explain slavery to an eight year old in my life and they really just don't. Wow. get it um wow. and so holding those different realities of what could be um mm-hmm. are really like are the things that are kind of holding me our shoulders that i stand on or the community mm-hmm. of support that i hold is generations behind and generations that are yet coming i i love that thought i actually love ending on that thought so we you know the, the question was kind of framed about thinking about previous generations but think about generations that are coming and you know yeah, as young as eight years old. I mean, have you all thought about that in your work? And these these generations that are now, you can see that they're they're coming. And how are they going to? How is your work going to help them enter this world and travel through it? You know. One one thing I want to connect to what um, Nikisa said earlier about. Um, you have a law, it, re- it reminded me, what you said reminded me of um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham jail, where he talks about there being just laws and unjust laws and how it's our moral obligation to break unjust laws. Um, and I say that as a preface because we have a lot of laws that are trying to be enacted in our state, in our country, um, that are gonna do serious harm to our future generations. We have, um, you talk about an eight-year-old, um, talk to an eight-year-old about slavery. The way we not repeat history is to to know about it and mm-hmm. to be aware of it. Um, that's, a, that's, that's important, um, which is why I write so much about history my personal history, black history, cultural history, women's history, because we need to know this information. It's it's important, it's a part of who we are. Um, and there's so many names of so many people, so many experiences that a lot of, a lot of us don't know that we should know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you, no, that's great, Jennifer. No, please, please go there. Melissa, I see your, I see I thought. Think, I'm, I'm with her. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we all are. Yeah. I think, I think it's, we feel, we feel incensed when we start thinking about certain states, including our, our own, trying to erase history and can't even speak of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, banning books. I mean, what what is going on? I mean, the good guys don't ban books. <laughs> yeah. You know, where'd you ever hear that? So. Yeah. Thank you. Jan, did you have a thought? I see the microphone going up. Oh, well, I um, I do teach children in the summertime, and I love working with the younger generation. Mm-hmm. I, I work with um, teaching them how to do printmaking with, um, with easy-cut linoleum blocks that they get to print, and it's their first exposure to mm-hmm. how printmaking works, and mm-hmm. they love it. It's really mm-hmm. fun. But it's so, it's always... I, just a pleasure to see their thinking and and their excitement mm-hmm. and just the opportunity that's there right mm-hmm. so when you when you think about the world now and the state that we're in you know you don't it, it, it's such a magical place to be you know you want to give that every opportunity to bird to blossom mm-hmm. right um I think some of these thoughts kind of get uh, get us into rounding out the discussion around the future and um, I wanted to end with Alma Thomas uh, from the show and read the quote that we have on the wall for her. Um, We artists are put on God's good earth to create. Some of us may be black, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is for us to create 
to give form to what we have inside of us. We can't accept any barriers, any limitations of any kind on what we create or how we do it. So that's Alma Thomas talking about just creativity, a woman, these issues at the fore. She sort of sums up a beautiful notion in my mind. Um, so kind of as we reflect on some of the thoughts that we shared tonight, and my mind certainly is going in lots of places right now, I thought we could um, you know, think about, we're, we're gonna leave this conversation in this beautiful space. We're gonna return to some crazy headlines, right? We see them all over the place. And they, of course, aim to give us some insight in what the future is going to look like, right? Um, especially equal rights, women's, women's, women's advancement in the world. But in your minds, how are you processing this moment? And how are you preparing for what's ahead? I can't uh, predict the future, but something that I think it is a good thing that we should do is to uh, think um, we, we live in a global village. And um, it's not a matter uh, uh, if the countries is different, uh, but the unhappiness of the people who lives in other sides of the world can have effect in our life uh, uh, from a different base. And uh, I think the only things that we should do to have uh, attention to this unhappiness around the world. Uh, for example, mm, Afghanistan is not part of the Iran, it's a different country, but I like to amplify the voice of the women in Afghanistan because they be banned to educate uh, education. They can't go to, the girls can't go to school or university anymore uh, and I like to talk about it I, I think uh, it is my responsibility as a woman that um, amplify the, the voice of them and, uh, and uh, I think if we think like this uh, and um, just care about the other issues and concerns around the world uh, probably we can have a better future thank you thank you Nikisa I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> and I'm hope that we can all hold it together. Um, I work at a Women's Rights and Empowerment Network. Uh, we are an statewide advocacy org. So the things like the book bans, I've been all over the state to school board meetings supporting folks that are um, testifying to try to prevent that. My colleagues are at the state house right now trying to prevent an abortion ban and I'm listening, Alma's words are trickling behind me and your words are playing in my head. And what I'm thinking about is like, as we begin to embrace like a global village, as we begin to think about how um, the injustices in one part of the world impact other parts of the world, we also must be okay with um, really wrestling with identity and being able to hold it um, and the ways in which folks would like for it to be held. So I hear um, about this 101-year-old artist who um, is an incredible artist and wants to be identified as an artist and not a woman artist. Right. And I sit on this stage as a black, queer, non-binary person who wants y'all to call all the words mm -hmm. um, in this identity because I fought um, to be this person. Um, it is very hard to live in this embodiment, um, to, mm -hmm. to be consistently erased or misgendered or misunderstood. And so in this moment of like how I'm gearing or how I'm holding is that I want us to really like use um, deep compassion and critical thinking as we approach all that's coming forward. You cannot be in all the places um, to prevent all the harm that is happening in the world. If, the, if you have a consistent action and a consistent commitment, then um, we're closer um, to something um, that is a more just world than before. And so that's the thing that I'm holding, um, that I'm allowed to disagree with how people might interpret things. I want us to, to crash through every barrier, mm -hmm. but I want for people to see the fullness and richness of a human being in the midst of that. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm like wrestling and hopefully 
y'all can stay, you know, there's some smiles. So we didn't, yeah, not yeah. throw me away. Um, and that's okay. <laughs> but like that wrestling is something that I want us to do more often and do it in public and in private so mm-hmm. that we can really be making those steps to a real um, global village, a real uh, more just world. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Kenya. Um, one thing I've heard you say, Kenya, is talking about consistency. And um, Nakisa, your comments made me think about, again, letter from Birmingham jail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, uh, I think, I don't think I have the quote exactly right, but justice, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So what you say about if something is happening in some part of the world, then we need to pay attention and we need to, you know, try to do whatever we can. Um, I think um, another thing with this quote, and I think going back to something Jan said earlier, is to create is to be free. And to create is to to think the thoughts that some people don't want you to think. Mm-hmm. And so that, that act in itself is is revolutionary and that's why it's trying to be that's why people are trying to suppress it at every turn mm-hmm. um i'm sorry i don't remember what the original question oh no <laughs> this is fine I'm sorry. no it, it, i can it, just keep going oh no you're absolutely <laughs> I, fine okay because yeah. it's like the future right yeah, yeah. okay um, and preparing. so <laughs> um no i just made i just i just love like the, the connections yeah um so to, to me, the, the way forward is we continue to educate ourselves, educate others, especially our young people, give them that opportunity to do printmaking or come in and write a poem real quick, um, give them the opportunity to use their minds um, because they have beautiful minds and they have all of these wonderful thoughts and ideas and sometimes they just don't have a platform for it. So just mm-hmm. giving young people the platform to just come in and be and listen mm-hmm. to what they have to say because they do have awesome thoughts. And I'm going to stop right there because I feel like I'm just rambling. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Jenny. I'll just try to add on. Um, you know, I think about the future a lot because I have a, a grandson who's almost a year old. And what I really love about my law firm is that we're so intergenerational and I love being here with all of y'all and I really appreciate this opportunity to connect with all of y'all and don't get these many opportunities and then when we leave here tonight I don't know when I'll see you again but I want to you know Mm -hmm. and as we work on these really hard problems it's so easy to get bogged down and depressed about them but I want to appreciate this you know, and I do. And we got to remember that we're all working hard in our own ways mm-hmm. and pass that on down to the next generation and encourage people to, to be involved, but to work together. I'm a museum visitor everywhere I go. I go to museums and I think it's very exciting to see their programming now is including all kinds of um, diverse artists from all different kinds of backgrounds. Yes. And yes. it's just really exciting to go and see all the different exhibits that mm-hmm. that are so inclusive. Mm-hmm. So you're making a good pitch for that the muse- vis- visit a museum alone. Oh, I think visiting museums <laughs> is great. Yes, but I just, agree. <laughs> I think that they sort of mirror the world. And yeah. I think the world is becoming more mm-hmm. open yeah. to all different kinds of people. I love it, Jan. <laughs> Thank you all. I'm sorry, go ahead, Melissa. Okay. <laughs> no that's just really how I feel <laughs> and I mean if, if a museum is doing the work that it should it should be really reflective of the world right and I mean it's it's there's a lot going on a lot to reflect y'all thank you so much for tonight's conversation thank you thank you thank you it's it there's a lot of uh complex issues ideas challenges um you all come from very diverse backgrounds we could have sat here for a long time tonight. But um, hopefully this brief discussion gives you a a little bit of insight, information, and, and really inspiration. 
So thank you, thank you. I'd love to open it up with a few questions. Yeah, round of applause. Um, we have a few minutes. I can take a few questions. We would love to um, entertain with our panelists. Yeah. Right there. Rashad, there you go. Yeah, I see you. <laughs> I have a book coming out in November. <laughs> uh, it's called Travel and Mercy. Um, I am also working on some other projects as Poet Laureate. Um, so if you just Google my name or Columbia Poet Laureate, um, you can follow me on social media, stay up to date on those projects coming up. Is, is your book gonna be for sale? Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> definitely want to, <laughs> oh um, yeah. So, um, my pre-order sales start in a couple right. of months, I believe. Right. So, um, I'll have that on my social media as wonderful. well. Wonderful. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. We'll have to have you back Jennifer for that. That'd be wonderful. For me, uh, uh, because I, as I mentioned, uh, we have a kind of revolution in our country, and now my focus is uh, to amplify that uh, con the concerns that people have in Iran in my artworks now. And yeah, I'm working on this. Thank you. So I'm just curious have you been back to Iran recently? Are you planning to go back? Uh, no, okay. not. I think the last time was uh, two years ago, okay. uh, but because I am active in my um, social media, uh, it is not safe <laughs> Got to it. turn back Got for it. now. I was curious about that. Okay. I continue to work on my art all the time, so I'm I'm always thinking of of making new pieces and um, I want to continue working on my ideas about um, El Nino's and storms and and the water and the earth and I just can't stop it's right. there's no you know I just keep going I want to make some large pieces I like to work on paper and mom is still working a little bit too she yeah she I'm can. gonna work some with her this week we're gonna get some paints out and Good. she'll work she she you know it's interesting because there's memory there mm -hmm. so as once you put the paper in front of her and she's got all the work she's got her tools she just starts working she has mm -hmm. memory of how to do things if you ask her do you want to paint she'll say maybe later or tomorrow mm -hmm. but if you just get out the materials all of a sudden she's working mm -hmm. Wonderful, great. Kenya and Melissa, I'm not sure if you want to jump in or if you'd like to add. Anything. Well, we've already drafted the lawsuit to um, challenge any abortion ban they pass. All right. <laughs> We're ready. <laughs> I'm so glad you're ready. Um, <laughs> uh, it is not my project, but like I mentioned earlier, our legislators are still meeting. Um, down the street and this is a special session and one piece of feedback that I've heard and maybe you should pass it to your friends particularly all across mm -hmm. the state is that some of them are saying that they have not heard from you um, as to what you feel about the current issue we know that not necessarily to be true <laughs> um, but if you have the time or the energy to make a phone call to send an email to mm -hmm. tell a friend um, this this is a moment. I know it is frustrating and overwhelming to be in a space um, where our legislators should be listening to our needs, but also addressing key concerns like child hunger, access to health care, and other things that are happening in the state of South Carolina. But it, should you have the time, I, I would invite you um, to, to pick up the phone call or to um, head to RIN's website it's, it's complicated, okay? Our website has lots of layers, but looking for the take action page and to take action and to let your legislator know. We do a lot of work, so there's a lot going on there, but if you take action, I would, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Kenya. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Maybe I have time for one more. And I'll just repeat the question. The question is, um, is there something that has surprised any of the panelists as of late um, as they work? Any surprises that have come up? People are kind of responding as you expected. <laughs> Things are happening about as. <laughs> Unfortunately so, says Malia. <laughs> a couple weeks ago, um, we hosted a Meet Me at the State House thing. Ren has this program every other Wednesday. You can come to the State House. We'll help you pull your legislators out of meetings so you can have a one to one conversation. And we've been doing that in partnership with all different kinds of coalition um, members, all different kinds of subjects, whatever folks are really passionate about. And a couple weeks ago, there was a bunny, emotional support animal, that was brought to the grounds. And I was utterly surprised <laughs> how many people stopped or found joy in something that weighed less than eight pounds um, that asked questions about where did it live and who takes care of it. And, right. and, then, and then both security of the grounds, uh, folks that come out on a regular occasion, the next time we were at the state house, were like, where is the bunny? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, it's just, for me, like this deep um, surprise, but also gift, to like relish in small things mm -hmm. and the reminder that we need to be grounded and connected to animals and connected to other things beyond, even when we're doing the good work, right. we need those outlets and those spaces. Right. I think on that note where I want to end is that all of you are doing tremendous lifts in this work. So my wish for you is really that as you continue to do the work, that you are also lifted in ways that that uh, are caring and comforting for you because it's hard work and that that cup can get empty really fast and to fill it up is hard. So I just wanna say on behalf of everyone here in the museum and in our communities, thank you so much for all the contributions and the work that you are doing um, in our communities. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. So the exhibition is open until Sunday. It closes. Please share it with your friends. Come on in and think about these words and reflection. And the exhibition, I think, would be very nice. And the galleries are open for about 15 more minutes. So race on in, catch a few of these pieces, check the quotes out, and um, have a good evening. That concludes our program. Thank you.